Hallelujah. See, you are not going to live the Christian life just by being prayed for. You need the steady flow of the Word of God. Change your mind. Renew your mind, you know, according to the Word of God. If we are just going to give you, you know, just candy floss, how are you going to live your Christian life? You need the Word of God. The Word of God in your mind, and the Word of God in your heart, the Word of God in your spirit that will keep you strong. Amen. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 11, what are we studying? The nine gifts of the Spirit. Say, the nine gifts. So what are we studying tonight? You're sounding very nice. Okay, let's all read together, right? Verse 1. You ready? Let's go. One, two, three, go. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. In other words, the Apostle Paul was saying, regarding spiritual gifts, he says, I do not want you to be ignorant. In other words, he says, I want you to be knowledgeable. Amen? Amen. So many people, when you hear them say, they say, well, God's given some gifts. We don't really know what gifts He's given. Um, if you're lucky or fortunate, lucky is not a good word. If you're fortunate, you get a gift. If not, you don't get a gift. Some people operate in a gift. Some people don't. But Paul, the apostle, said, I do not want you to be ignorant concerning spiritual gifts. Then he goes on to teach us about them, which means to say that God, in all of his wisdom, wanted his church to know about spiritual gifts, right? So let's read. He says, Ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God called Jesus accursed. And stop there. In other words, if a man or a woman is operating by a different spirit, an antichrist spirit, a satanic spirit, he cannot say Jesus is Lord. Amen? Amen. A person can only acknowledge and confess with his mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord by the Holy Ghost. Amen. That means the Holy Spirit inside of him. Let's go. Verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts but the same Spirit, and there are differences of administrations but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it is the same God. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. Hallelujah. That means the whole body of Christ will be profited. Profit will come to the body of Christ when there's a manifestation of the different giftings of God. Hallelujah. I mean, when one is healed, we all rejoice. When one speaks in tongues, another interprets it and gives a message, and the whole church is edified. You understand? The word of knowledge comes, or the word of wisdom operates. Something happens. The whole body or the whole church is edified by that. It says, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Verse 9, let's read. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of a healing by the same Spirit. To another the working of miracles to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing... Hallelujah. So how many gifts of the Spirit are there? Oh boy, you are so intelligent nine gifts of the spirit hallelujah 
Say hallelujah. hallelujah. So we said there are three revelation gifts, right? Yes. Three revelation gifts. And they are, number one, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the discerning of spirits. So the nine gifts can be broken up into three groups of three, one being the revelation gifts, which is the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, and the discerning of spirits. And then you have the three power gifts, which is the gifts of what? The gift of faith, number one. Number two, the working of miracles and the gift of healing. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. And then we have three inspirational gifts. And inspirational gifts, I told you, are really vocal gifts. And they are, number one, what? Okay, prophecy. And then? Uh-huh. And the interpretation of tongues. So we have, number one, prophecy. Number two, diverse kinds of tongues. And number three, interpretation of tongues. Hallelujah. Then we went on in our last lesson and we defined the first gift, which is the word of wisdom. And this is what we said about the word of wisdom. We said, this is a supernatural revelation or insight into the divine will and purpose of God showing how to solve any problem that may arise. Amen. Did you get a hold of that? Amen. Hallelujah. This is the supernatural revelation or insight into the divine will and purpose showing what? How to solve any problem that may arise. Say, I got that, Pastor. Got that. All right. Then we shared examples, right? And uh, how the word of wisdom operated. And uh, we saw how it operated in the life of Solomon. You remember? What happened? A lady had a child killed. And two ladies were fighting. That child is mine. And this one's mine. And they ended up by Solomon. And you saw how the gift of wisdom operated in the life of Solomon. And he operating in that gift, rightfully returned the child to its rightful mother. Just, to, just recapping, right? We have went through that. Then we had the word of wisdom operating in Genesis 6, 6, in the life of who? Of Noah. God came to Noah, said to Noah that, uh, you know, uh, everything's come to him. He has seen the wickedness of all mankind and that now he wants to destroy all flesh. And then the word of wisdom came to Noah that he should what? Build an ark. And God gave him specifically the measurements of the ark and he went on building the ark and him and his household were saved. He would have not known except the word of wisdom operated in his life. Then we saw the word of wisdom operating in the life of Joseph, where we see in Genesis 45, Joseph started to address all of his brothers, and they started to seek forgiveness, and they were sorry when they saw it was Joseph, and they remembered what wickedness they had done to Joseph. But Joseph started to say to them, no, this wasn't the plan of God. That the whole of Israel was saved. Amen. Amen. So Joseph did not see all of the things that happened to him in a negative context. He saw it as the plan and purpose of God. Amen. That it had to go through that. And by Joseph suffering or the things that he went through, he saved the whole nation of Israel, including the house of his father Amen. and his brothers. And then we saw the wisdom of, the word of wisdom operating in the life of Agabus in the book of Acts, chapter 11. We saw how that he, by the word of wisdom, saw 
that there was going to be a famine in the land. And he gave a prophetic word. He gave a word of wisdom regarding that. And then in Acts chapter 21 and verse 12, we see how by the word of wisdom, Agabus, the same prophet, what he did was he said to the apostle Paul, he said, when you go to Jerusalem, you will be bound. You remember that one? I shared that scripture with you. And then going on, we saw the word of wisdom operating in the life of the shepherds in Luke chapter 2 verse 10. How that the word of wisdom came to them that there was a child born. It was Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And they knew by the word of wisdom that God had sent down the Messiah. Amen? Amen. Then we had the word of wisdom in Acts chapter 26 where Paul recounts his conversion, how that God spoke to him. And then we had in Acts chapter 27, verses 9, how Paul was being taken prisoner from one place to another. And Paul said to them, he said to the people that was manning the ship, what did he say to them? He said, uh, we should not take this journey. We should not undertake this journey. I perceive that great harm will come to us. And they did not listen. How did, how did Paul have that revelation? How did that knowledge come to Paul? He was operating under the word of wisdom. And then an angel of the Lord appeared to Paul and started to speak to Paul and said to Paul that you will land at an island and uh, you must appear before uh, the emperor you will appear, so no harm will come to you, and no harm will come to the crew. So the Apostle Paul stood up and he says, men and brethren, he says, do not fear. He says, today an angel of the Lord stood by me and signified and showed me how no harm will come to our lives. And none of them died. The, the ship was wrecked, if you read the book of Acts, and they all landed on the island, but not one of them, no harm came to their bodies. None of them died. None of them perished. How did Paul know it was the word of wisdom operating in his life? Amen. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. So, uh, let's deal with the second gift, which is the word of knowledge. Say word of knowledge. word of knowledge. Now, let's define the word of knowledge, right? You ready for this? You can take down notes if you're taking down notes. The word of knowledge is supernatural revelation of divine knowledge or insight in the divine mind or plan and also the plans of others that man could not know himself. Hallelujah. Did you get that? The word of knowledge is supernatural revelation of divine knowledge or insight into the divine mind or plan and also the plan of others that man could not know of himself. Wow. Hallelujah. So this spiritual gift is called what? The word of knowledge. So the word of knowledge is a supernatural revelation by the Holy Ghost of certain facts in the mind of God. As the Spirit of God moves, He gives a word of knowledge to certain people about certain facts. And so, you don't know, uh, uh, you didn't, you know, search for this knowledge, but it came to you by the Spirit of God. Suddenly you know. Hallelujah. It operates, I tell you. It's powerful. It's powerful. It operates by the anointing of God. That means you can just look at somebody and suddenly the Spirit of God will reveal something to you about that somebody. You understand? So it's a, it's a word of knowledge that comes to you. Wonderful. So the word of knowledge is what? Say supernatural revelation of divine knowledge. Or insight in the divine mind or plan and also the plan of others 
that man could not know of himself. All right, let's look at an example then of the word of knowledge and operation in Scripture. Let's look at Samuel's first prophecy in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 7. Would you turn there? Praise the Lord. Are you ready for the word? The word of God is anointed. By the time we finish of all of these lessons for the next few witness days, you will become so sharp about spiritual gifts. See, you can only operate with clear biblical understanding if you understand these things. You found it, verse 7? All right, you ready to read? Okay, let's read. One, two, three, go. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Hear my, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called as the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Amazingly enough, that the Lord was speaking to Samuel in the voice of Eli. <laughs> because when God spoke, take note what was the response of Samuel. He went to Eli. Yes. So whose voice did he hear? Eli. So the Lord spoke in the voice of the man of God. It's a powerful truth there. Verse 11. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, now watch, watch. It's a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge, rather, that's coming. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel. Now watch. It is a word of knowledge coming to Samuel by the Lord. He's revealing his plans and purposes to him. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, you can read with me, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. Ooh. <laughs> That's why there must be correction in the house of God. Every now and again, we have to correct God's people if they are scripturally incorrect. Or resorting to things that are displeasing to God. We have to. See what he says. He says, because his sons made themselves vile. And he restrained them not. And verse 14 says, And therefore have I sworn unto the house of Eli, That the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice, Nor offering for ever. And Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Did you see that? So God revealed to young Samuel what he would do with Eli. Eli forgot, or had not rather, taken the necessary steps when his sons were wrong, he did not correct them. He did not take the necessary steps to restore divine order. And God spoke up. 
And he showed Samuel how he would judge Eli and what he would do. That's why the Bible says here in verse 15, And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Hallelujah. What was that? A word of? Aha. Uh -huh. You see the definition now? You, you saw the definition? The word of knowledge is a supernatural revelation of divine knowledge and insight into the divine man, divine mind, the plan or the plans of others that man could not know himself. That means what God had revealed to Samuel at that time about Eli and the judgment that was going to come on Eli's house, he did not know it by himself. He knew it how? By revelation. He knew it by word of knowledge coming to him. God spoke to him. Thank God for the voice of God. He speaks. Amen. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Then in 2 Kings, we see another powerful example. So I would like you to turn there to the second, second book of Kings, chapter 6 and verse 8. Hallelujah. Man, as I read that scripture, I really felt the anointing of the Lord. And we see in 2 Kings chapter 6 something powerful. It was the Syrians' plans revealed to Israel. Watch now. Are you ready to read? One, two, three, let's go. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. How did he know? Did he get a fax? Did he get an email? Did he have a meeting? He knew by the Spirit of God. Verse 10, let's read. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him off and saved himself there. Not once, but twice. Hallelujah. Therefore, the heart of the king of Assyria was so troubled for this thing. And he called all of his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? In other words, what he was accusing his servants of, he says, which one of you are spying? Because the king knows all my plans, surely someone here is telling him. But it was not so. It was the Spirit of God revealing to the prophet of God what was the plans of the king of Syria. And then because of that, he could take counter steps and counter measures. And the king was frustrated because Israel knew all of his plans. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And look at verse 12. And one of his servants said, None, my lord or king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words thou speakest in thy bedchamber. <laughs> wow. Sometimes dealing with the work of God, you know, we know many things, not by people telling us but by divine inspiration, by divine revelation. It's a word of knowledge. Hallelujah. Won't you like that gift to operate in your life? It can. The word of wisdom. The word of knowledge. If you desire it, you can ask God and say, Lord, let it operate in my life. Amen. That you may know things beforehand. Amen. Sometimes when you pray, you could actually see the meeting before you come here. Amen. You can see a face. You can see the clothing of the person. You can see a name. You can see a disease. You can call it by name. How? By what? Revelation. Hallelujah. Then in Acts chapter 9, verse 11 and 12, would you turn there? Acts chapter 9. See, first I gave you a definition of the word of knowledge. Now I'm giving you examples. 
in Scripture how they operate, right? Once you see them operative in the Word of God, then they can operate in your life. Hallelujah. So I want the Word of Wisdom. I want the Word of Knowledge to operate in my life. See, if you have an understanding, then it will. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 9, verse 11. Would you read? One, two, three, go. And the Lord said unto him, Wow. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go to the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. That means the Spirit of God revealed to him there was a man called Saul of Tarsus, and even told him what he was doing, that the man was praying. And had seen a vision. In a vision, a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him, and that he might receive his sight. You remember the story. He was blind, you know, the Damascus Road experience. And so the man was praying. And the Apostle Paul had a vision of Ananias coming in and placing his hands on him, that his sight would be restored. Isn't that amazing? So while you are praying, God can give you visions. Hallelujah. A word of knowledge. Thank you, Lord Jesus. While you're praying in other tongues, in other tongues, God can give you a word of knowledge. While you are driving, you're going to work, God can reveal to you what is going on. If someone is plotting against you, He'll show it to you. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you don't know which way to go, whether it's left or right, God can show it to you. Can't he not show it to you? Okay, Acts chapter 10, verse 9. Peter's vision on the housetop and subsequent meeting with Cornelius. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You found it? Acts chapter 10, verse 9. On the morrow... Let's read. Go ahead. And the voice said unto him again the second time, What my father has finished, let all not thou come. This was done twice. And the vessel was seen and obeyed into heaven. Now he that doubted in himself what the position which he had seen should be. Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made him quiet. Who said to him? Okay, go ahead, verse 20.
Wow. The Spirit of God had put that whole meeting together. Showed Peter what was coming, who was coming, and what was the meaning. Gave him a vision. Do you see that? Can God not speak to you like that? Can you not get into a trance? Can you not, while praying, God suddenly takes you away and opens things to you in the dimension of the Spirit? Hallelujah. So many things can happen. God can reveal to you, apply for that contract, apply for that job, show you somebody. Do you know how we bought this building? I bought this building by a dream. There was no for sale sign here. That's the truth. It was not advertised. I saw in a dream a man's face. I knew the man. I had forgotten his name. The next morning, I felt the urge by the Spirit of God to go into town. So I went to town. And after my wife had made some, did a little bit of shopping, I said, I need to go to the bookstore a certain bookstore in town. And she said, what book do you need? You're always buying books. So I said, I don't really need a book, but I need to get there. As I got to the front of the store, as I parked my car, the man that I had seen in the dream was just about getting in his car to drive off. If I had gone there two minutes later, I would have missed him. So I greeted him casually and spoke to him, still not knowing why I saw him in the dream. And as we spoke, I said, what are you doing now? He says, well, you know, the last time you met me in that building, I'm no longer there. I'm working now for another company. So I said, uh, well, what, whatever happened to that building? He says, no, the owner wants to sell it. And he gave me the owner's number. So then I knew why I was there. Amen. So I phoned the owner and said to him, I want to buy your building. He said, how did you know? <laughs> he said, how did you know that the building was up for sale? Because there's no for sale sign. I've not advertised it. Who told you? If I had told him, would he have believed me? <laughs> you understand? God speaks in dreams and visions. God speaks to you by the word of knowledge. He can show you things. You don't have to guess. God, by His Spirit, can reveal it to you. Hallelujah. Then Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. Let's turn there. Revelation chapter 1. I want you to read that with me. Are you enjoying the word? I love the word of God. The word is anointed. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. And we're going to read right up to verse 20, all right? Okay, let's go. One, two, three, go. Saying unto me, 
fear not. I'm the first and the last. I'm he was liveth, was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which I have seen. And the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery that I sourced in my heart. The seven stars of the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest. Spirit of God speaking to a man of God. Telling him things and interpreting those things. Hallelujah. So it can operate in your life, right? The word of knowledge. The word of knowledge you would know secret things god will reveal to you secret things i'll never forget this many years back i went to a home cell and while i was praying just prior to me going to the home cell i saw three clouds one was a black cloud one was a red cloud and one was a white cloud so i did not know what this was so when I got to the home cell, I started to pray as the people were worshiping God. We had about 30 people in the home cell. And then I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, you showed me three clouds with three colors. What are they? I don't know what you have shown me. And the Lord said to me, the black cloud represents a person that is here that is demon possessed. And he said, the red cloud is representation of the blood of Jesus Christ. I want you to know there's enough power in the blood of Jesus to set the person free. And he said the white cloud represents the person once he's free. Once she's free, will be white as snow and praising me in purity. So that's what I saw in a vision while I was praying. Three clouds, three different colors. Didn't know the interpretation of it. But when I prayed, God showed it to me. So I naturally said that then after we had worshipped, I said, there's someone here that is demon-possessed or oppressed terribly by the devil. I said, but God wants you to know there's enough power in the blood of Jesus to set you free and that you'll be white as snow when he sets you free. And so a lady put her hand up and she said, it's me. She said, I do not belong to this church. I belong to another church. She said, but for years I've been oppressed terrible. She said, so bad it was that yesterday I contemplated committing suicide. She said, but someone invited me to this meeting. God's mercy. God's mercy. That he loved that woman so much that he revealed to a yielded person, to the Spirit of God, what was going to take place. You're a candidate for the blessing of God. You're a candidate for the gift of the word of knowledge to become operative in your life. That God will show you things, not so that you can go and talk about it. God will show you things so that you can help them. Hallelujah. Do you see that? If you'll only yield to the Spirit of God, God can use you. Sometimes I tell people what I know and they think someone told me. (laughs) No, it's the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. When you worship, when you praise, when you pray, when you're spending time, suddenly God will speak to you. He'll show you something. He'll give you a name. He'll give you a condition. He'll tell you about an incident. And then you say, oh Lord, what do you want me to do? Then he says, pray. And then when you pray, then he says, pray for that person or pray for that situation. Wow, it's so wonderful to be yielded to the Holy Ghost. I can preach to you and teach you about the Holy Ghost. If I start now, we'll finish on Sunday. I promise you, without any notes, I will be able to tell you about the Holy Spirit, what He has done, what He has shown me, who He is. The Holy Spirit is a real person. He's the first person in the Godhead. In the beginning, in Genesis, the Bible says, And the Spirit of the Lord hovered upon the waters. So He's... he's, he's, he's part of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. God's given us the Holy Spirit. Now that you've accepted Jesus Christ and made Jesus Christ 
your Lord and Savior. The Holy Ghost dwells in you. Amen. The Spirit of God is upon you. Amen. He leads you. He guides you. You do not have to walk confused. You do not have to walk bewildered. Or being, you know, just, I don't know what's going on. Oh, you do know. The Holy Spirit is with you. He will reveal all things to you. He's your comforter. He's your paraclete. He's your helper. He's your counselor. He's your advocate. He's your intercessor. He's your strengthener. He's your standby. That's all you need. You need no one else but the Holy Ghost. I've made the Holy Ghost my friend. <laughs> when you make him your friend, he'll show you things. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. He'll help you. He'll give you words of knowledge, words of wisdom. Hallelujah. You understand? Praise the Lord. The Holy Ghost is one of the most beautiful persons in this whole wide world. He's real. Many Christians don't know that, but he's real. Tell your neighbor, he's real. He's a person. In the morning when you get up, you should welcome him. In the morning when you get up, you should yield yourself to him. You should invite him in the affairs of your life. When you are working, you should invite him to lead you, guide you, teach you, help you, give you instruction. When you are in a service like this, I always say to the Holy Spirit, come with me. I yield the service to you. You lead me. You guide me. You teach me. You help me preach. The Holy Spirit is a person. Walk with Him. Learn to yield yourself to Him. Learn to acknowledge Him. As you surrender to Him, as you yield to Him, He will lead you. He will guide you. He will become your friend. He will show you things. When you sleep at night, the last thing you should do is say, Good night, Holy Spirit. When you get up in the morning, the first thing you should say, Good morning, Holy Spirit. I've learned... <laughs> I've learned to be, make him my friend. I've learned to walk in step with him. Not out of step, in step. Hallelujah. When you learn to depend on the Holy Spirit like that. See, the love of human beings are fickle. Why do I say that? The Bible says Jesus did not commit himself to any man. For he knew what was in the heart of man. See, one day they would praise you. The next day they will crucify you. That's what they did to Jesus. When he made his triumphant entry, they all took palm leaves. And they started to wave and say, Hosanna. When it suits them, they praise you. And then when their hearts get sour, they'll crucify you. The first same one that said Hosanna would say, kill him. Because Pilate said, who would you want me to release to you? Jesus or Barabbas? They cried out the louder. They said, Barabbas. Crucify him. So they wanted the people. Watch what the people wanted. They wanted a criminal released, but the Son of God crucified. You think people today are any different? No. They love you for a season. They'll stroke you for a season. It's when you are singing their tune. They will dance. Change the tune. They'll have a war cry against you. So people are fickle. I've learned that in life. <laughs> I've learned that in life. People are fickle. They love you today. They'll crucify you tomorrow. So I've learned to love people. But don't commit myself to people. Commit myself to the Holy Spirit. So when I'm alone, I'm not alone. You understand? So I'm not moved by people. I'm moved by the Holy Ghost. If I'm all alone, I'm happy. Why? I'm with Him. He leads me. He guides me. He teaches me. He He's real. There were times, there were many times, I would be praying in the room and suddenly I would feel strong wind pass me. And then what looked like to see who was there, it was the Holy Ghost. Amen. There were times I'd pray and I'd see a shadow just going past. And I would look to see who was there. It was the Holy Ghost. 
There were times I would pray and I would smell fresh bread. And I would think, what is this? It was the presence of the Holy Ghost. There were times I would pray and it would seem like, so, you know, a sweet smell of roses in there. And I would think, who is this? It's the Holy Ghost. There was a time I was praying in a house where someone had called me where the person was plagued with the tokolosh. So I went to pray with one of the brothers in the church. And as I was praying, man, as I entered the house, there was an eerie, terrible feeling. I mean, you could feel, you know, just devils in that place. But when I started to pray, man, there was like wind came out, you know, through the window. Strong wind. And it blew. So much so that we nearly fell down. And the person that was with me jumped and he said, Pastor, Pastor. And it went across the room and left out through the window. It was the presence of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And that tokolosh was gone. <laughs> there were times I'd drive in the car and I'd feel like someone sitting next door to me. It's the presence of the Holy Ghost. He's a person. Acknowledge Him. He's not away from you. He's with you. You understand? If you would only learn to make Him your friend, then you can never walk afraid. You can never be afraid. You understand? Everything could be against you. But if you learn to make the Holy Ghost your friend, then you cannot be afraid. Because somehow, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, there's a strength that comes on you. There's a boldness. You become fearless. You understand? Learn to walk with Him. Learn to acknowledge Him. Learn to know that He's your friend. You don't need other friends. You just need the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Sometimes I look at people's faces. I just look at them. And God reveals to me what they've been doing. And somehow... Later, when I would say something, they think, well, someone told pastor. No. My friend told me. <laughs> you, think, you think I'm joking? He's beautiful. I said he's beautiful. He's wonderful. He's my friend. He's your friend too. It's just that why he doesn't speak to you the way you want him to speak to you, you have not yet invited him in. You have not made him your friend. You see, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost is a gentleman. He'll only come in if you'll... Uh -huh. Hallelujah. I, like I said, I can speak to you all night and tell you story upon story, tell you account of, of account of the Holy Ghost. He's a person. He can help you in your job. When I was working years back, he helped me solve certain cases. <laughs> I was one day talking to a man, and the Holy Ghost said to me, he's lying. So, he did. I looked at the man, I said, sir, you're not telling me the truth, you are lying. He says, no, I swear I'm telling you the truth. I went to the neighbor and I found out the story, came back to him, I said, you see, I told you you're lying. Now jump at the car, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> he can. He'll show you things. Hallelujah. Amen. Turn to Matthew 16, verse 16. What are we talking about? Mm -hmm. What is the word of knowledge? It's a supernatural revelation of divine knowledge or insight in the divine mind or plan and also the plan of others that man could not know of himself. The Holy Spirit is so real, so real, so real, so real. Who do you think helps us to heal people? It's the Holy Ghost. Who do you think helps us to cast out demons? The Holy Ghost. Who do you think helps us to preach? The Holy Ghost. Who do you think helps us to teach the Word of God? It's the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. That's why I always say to you, I say, He's the boss 
of the church. He is the master of the church. If you ask me who's the pastor of the church, what would my answer be to you? I told you I'm not the pastor of the church. I said to you the Holy Ghost is the pastor of the church. I just listen to what he says. And I do what he says. If you will stand, that's why I always say, if you would come around a committee of men, carnal men, and try to run the church, you will fail. It's the Holy Ghost that's in charge. He knows. He knows all things. He knows the steps we should take. He knows the way we should go. Hallelujah. You understand? He is wonderful. He's marvelous. And He's working on your behalf. He has your interest at heart. Oh boy. He watches over you. Listen. Let me share this before I read that last scripture. If you are challenged in life tonight, if there are challenges that are coming against you, don't be fretful. Don't be disheartened. Those challenges will grow your faith. It's an opportunity for you to exercise your faith. I remember some years back, not so long, just a few years back, I remember one time we were going through terrible financial difficulties. And I was with my brother-in-law and I was speaking. And I said to my brother-in-law, I said, I don't care. I said, this time around, I've made up my mind. I will believe God even if it kills me. Whether that was right to say or not is another issue. But you could have seen my heart in the thing. I said, I dare to believe God. I would rather die believing Him than checking out of here in unbelief. From that day, everything started to change. (laughs) You have just a little problem, a little challenge you want to throw in the towel, then you complain. I don't care what it is, whether it's sickness or whether it's a challenge at work, or whether it's a challenge with your finances, dare to believe God. I said to you, don't cower, don't throw in the towel. You just say, God, if you made a way in the Old Testament for the children of Israel, when they had no way out, when there was no water, you produced water. When there was no way out of the sea, you split that ocean. When there was no meat, you produced the birds. You understand? When there was no, nothing to eat, there was manna from heaven. So Lord, if you did it for them, I dare to believe you, you would do it for me. See, you are not angry enough yet. You have not come to a place where you are angry enough or determined enough to make the hand of God work for you. So when the trials come, the persecution come, when the challenges come, It's for you to make up your mind. You understand what I'm saying? See, I'm not preaching now to you from what I've read about other people. It's something that I've proven in my life. It is faith based on knowledge. You understand? Faith based on knowledge. If God did it for others, He can do it for you. Hallelujah. I mean, if God turns situations where there was no way out, if He did it for others, He can do it for you. That's why He gave us the gifts of the Spirit, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, to show us things. That's why He gave us the Holy Ghost to comfort us, to lead us, to guide us, to stand with us, to be our advocate, to stand, hallelujah, to advise us. Come on, talk to me. So you think, well, the doctor said there's no way out, you're going to die. Is, is his report true? No. no. There's a better report. Hallelujah. Whose report will you believe? They say to you, well, you're fired or you are retrenched. Must you believe that report? No. no. It's only temporal. The man that fired you hmm, can be fired himself tomorrow. Is that not so? Yes. I was speaking to some people today church people and I said to them 
I said, you know, one of the things you've got to learn is when you are dealing with a man of God, be careful who you're dealing with. See, Abraham and Lot. Lot didn't know he was dealing with. The Bible says that Abraham was a prophet. A prophet of God, mandated by God, commissioned by God. And so Lot was a carnal man. When Abraham said, you choose, his eyes started to look at what he could get. And he chose the land. What he should have done was said to Abraham, you choose. You're the prophet of God. If you, go, if you say go left, I'd go left. If you say you go right, I'd go right. But he was a carnal man, so he chose first. What happened to Lot? His wife died. He lost everything. His whole life was destroyed. Why? He did not perceive that was a man of God. You understand? So I said to the people today, I said, this might be like a business transaction. I said, but you must ask yourselves a question. Who am I dealing with? See, there's ranking in the spirit. Forget about how big or what car is driving or how big is his church. That's not important. Every man is ranked in the spirit. And if a man is ranked in the spirit, you better be careful how you handle him. You understand? Your blessing lies there. So be careful how, how you handle. Now when people handle you badly, do they know who you associated with? You understand? Yeah. Nothing can bring us down. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. We are just, we are destined to grow bigger. Yeah. We are destined for great things. Yeah. You are destined for great things. Yeah. People say, well, people say, well, all the churches are the same. Oh, no. I, 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 I beg to differ. I'm too intelligent for that. I've read my Bible several times. I understand the principles of God. I understand how it operates. You understand? We are not novices. We've been around a long time. So I understand the principles of God. So if I work them, I'll get the same results. You with me? So we cannot fail. You are too big to fail. I have seen it. People that try to, even at work, they may be in senior management, trying to do you harm. They will resign before you. They will be fired before you. You touch an anointed child of God, you will pay the price. You are anointed. There's a grace on you. There's a blessing on your life. It's operating on your life. How can they touch you and get away with it? That's why do not fear. You cannot fear. You understand? You can't fear. You cannot fear. Just dare to believe God. Dare to believe Him. Hallelujah. You will just grow. You, are you listening to me? You will just grow. The favor of the Lord will grow in your life. The blessing of the Lord is upon you. You will grow bigger and bigger and bigger. Your light will shine brighter and brighter and brighter. You cannot fail. These are not just words I'm speaking to you. I'm not a motivational speaker. No, I'm an anointed servant of God. I'm telling you, no weapon fashioned against you will prosper. No weapon formed against you will prosper. You will grow in the things of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. You will function with divine wisdom, saith the Spirit of God. And the, and the spirit of wisdom shall rest on you. The gift of wisdom shall operate on your life. The word of knowledge shall operate in your life. In the mighty name of Jesus, you will see things in the realm of the spirit. God will give you dreams and visions. When you sleep at night, he will communicate to you in dreams and visions. You will know the mind of God. Hallelujah. For thus saith the Lord, it shall be so. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Some of you are feeling an awesome anointing coming on you. It's a spirit of knowledge that's coming on you. It's a gift of knowledge. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Some of you are feeling the heat of God on you. It's coming on you mightily. Your feet are burning. Your hands are burning. It's a mighty anointing of the Lord. It's a spirit of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah.